Uh, we've received apologies today from Deputy Colin Ann and Senator Crockwell. The mobile phone notice, I would like to remind members to ensure their mobile phones are switched off. This is important as it causes serious problems for broadcasting, editorial and sound staff. Um, I'm very glad that today we have engagement on the work of the European Foundation uh, uh, for the Improvement of Living and Working Conditions by Mr. Juan uh, Mendez Valdez, Director of the European Foundation for Improvement of Living and Working Conditions. I'm delighted to welcome the Director uh, here today and uh, his officials uh, to the Joint Committee meeting. The European Foundation is the only EU-based agency in Ireland and has been doing essential work for many years in helping us to understand the trends in industries, in working conditions, in labour markets, and what life is like for Europeans and all those living in Europe. That information can be essential for policymakers like ourselves to understand the structures that exist and help us to tailor any changes to improve the lives of our citizens. I met with the director about six months ago and found it to be a very interesting engagement. So I am looking forward uh, to this today. I would also like to say that the foundation has been very good at sending this joint committee copies of its reports and other publications, which I'm sure you all found very informative and helpful. We find them to be of great use to us in doing our work. I would like to welcome you very much for being here with us today, and we're delighted to have you, and I look forward to hearing further about your work, as will the members. Before we begin, I'm sorry, but I have to remind everyone on the rules and privilege. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that members should not comment on, criticise, or make charges against a person outside of the House are unofficial either by name or in such a way as to make them identifiable. By virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. If you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that all the evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any persons or identity by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Uh, Mr. Um, Mendes, I would like to ask you now to make your presentation, and I'm sure the committee members will have questions and comments for you afterwards. And thanks again for taking time to be here with us today. Thank you very much. Uh, it is real. It's really a, a privilege to to be here in the houses of the Oireachtas. I think it is the, the third time that I have been given the opportunity to to be uh, in this committee in the previous legislative period, uh, the other occasions. And I would like to share with you some of the information or the the, the findings that we um, that is coming out uh, out of our work in the in Eurofound. The good news is that having this um, a committee for EU affairs, I will not speak about Brexit. I think you had enough of that. The bad news is that I will bombard you with a lot of information, and maybe uh, that requires to jump a bit to one topic to the next, maybe without the time to go in depth in all of them. But I hope that the, during the questions and answers, we can go maybe in more detail in some of them. Uh, as the Chair has mentioned, uh, we are the only EU agency, the centralized agency, uh, that is based in Ireland. Uh, but Ireland was, together with Germany, the two first countries having a EU agency. Uh, we were, the two first agencies were established in 1975. We were one of them. And since then, we have been operating in Dublin, where we have our headquarters, and with a small office in Brussels. We have a relatively large number of meetings in Brussels, but we have just a small office with so many rooms there and facilities. If you want to, to, to have an idea about the size or the volume of, 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 the, um, of the agency, uh, our budget is 20 million. Some people could think that it is too small. Some people can think that it is too, too big. It is, the, as it is, 20 million, and that, uh, uh, in terms of staffing, it's about 100 staff members that they are contracted directly uh, for your fund, not counting external contractors. Um, and maybe something a bit important or peculiar of our agency is that we have, uh, you have there the shamrock, 
uh, visualizing the, the, the tripartite structure of our governance. Uh, in our management board is not only the European Commission uh, or the governments, in the case of Ireland, they're represented by the Department of uh, um, Employment and Social Affairs, but also the two sides of social partners. So in the case of Ireland, and that for each member state, uh, it would be IBEC and the, and the Irish Trade Union Confederations. And we will have uh, soon also an independent expert appointed by the European Parliament in our board. Um, what do we do in Eurofound? We basically, the mission we say that is, is to provide knowledge, to provide information. Maybe I should stop here first. Uh, to provide information um, to assist policymakers, to assist you in the development of better social, employment, and work related policies. And our primary target group, it is the EU institutions, the European Commission, the European Parliament, the Council, but we also serve the national uh, governments or the social partners at the different, at the different levels. And uh, our strength is to provide comparative information. We do research, but where we try to help the member states to benchmark with each other, to see where they perform better, where they perform not so well, and there are some, there are some room for improvement. And a good example of, of this is probably the, 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 the best known uh, research pieces of Eurofound are the three Europe, European wide or pan European uh, surveys that we are running. The oldest one is the European Working Conditions Survey uh, that started in 1990 and we repeat every five years. And we look here at uh, different dimensions of job quality from the physical environment, the social environment, the intensity at work, autonomy, skills, earning, etc. The second one, the second oldest one, is the European Quality of Life Survey. We look here at the quality of life of Europeans and some elements of what we qualify as quality of the societies. And the, the first one is face-to-face -face interviews to over 40,000 uh, workers in Europe. The second one, it is citizens, not necessarily workers, could be worker, working or not working uh, citizens. And the third survey that we are running, it is the European Company Survey. There we interview representatives of the, of the company and they, they look at practice at company, the company, at company level. Um, I want to show you some of the main highlights if you look at this service and other sources of information of some elements that could be relevant for Ireland. And uh, if I were to mention some highlights, is uh, in terms of uh, quality of life, this is an optimistic and uh, satisfied country at this moment in time. Okay, you have been through a, a serious crisis, but certainly that's over. And if you compare with others, you are in that particular element, you are uh, scoring better than, than, the, than the EU average. If we look at job quality, again here, uh, as an average, uh, not entering individual jobs. In most dimensions of job quality, Ireland is doing well, uh, being in terms of autonomy or physical demands or a number of other dimensions. If we look at elements that they are related to, to what uh, I, I mentioned as the quality of society, there are a number of uh, also good uh, factors or good, uh, good dimensions uh, where Ireland is doing well, for example, the high level of, of uh, engagement with community activities, civic and community activities, relatively low level of tensions in society, and more or less average uh, standards levels of trust in national institutions. Uh, for the European institutions, it would be above, above average. Going a bit more in detail, and uh, you have here listed the, the full list of countries, but you have just to look there uh, the one in black that is the EU average, to identify that the second circle that it is in the upper in the table is Ireland. So uh, left you have the reported happiness of your citizens, and at the right you have the satisfaction with life, the general satisfaction with life as reported again by, by citizens. You see that uh, in, both, in both elements the rate of Ireland is the position with what matters. Don't look at the, at the, at the accurate pointer. It's a scale of uh, 0 to 10, and Ireland would be either uh, very close or similar to the situation of the Netherlands or the UK. In the center, the average would be countries like France or Spain, 
and at the bottom you have all the candidate countries or some old member states like, uh, like Greece, uh, some new member states like Bulgaria. And at the top you have the usual suspects that they are the Nordic countries. If you look at optimism, uh, we have a very interesting question because after the crisis, generally in Europe, people became more optimistic about their own future. But we have a second question about the future for their children and grandchildren. And there you see a huge difference. So the darker you see the, the country marked in this, in, this, uh, in this map, the better. So the more optimistic that you are about your children and grandchildren, and you see there the, Repub the Republic of Ireland relatively dark, so that's good news, uh, compared with the UK or compared with Germany or Spain, but even more difference if you compare with the countries like uh, Italy or France, that you see lighter there. They see that they are much more gloomy about the, their projections of the future for the children or grandchildren. This may reflect maybe uh, to a certain extent the, the perspectives on the evolution of the economy in the country, but probably uh, um, other, other elements are also relevant to this. I mentioned, moving to the quality of the society, that one element that we consider important is the engagement in the uh, community activities and civic activities. Generally, in all of them, Ireland rates relatively well. And you have here an example in volunteering. That's something that coming from a country that is in the lower part of the table in this particular dimension, uh, it was very visible for me, for example, when I came to, to Ireland eight years ago. But you see the average there. It is 70% in the EU, and Ireland is uh, among the top group in uh, involving, involvement in volunteering uh, and civic activities. An other element that is important, uh, negative if it's very high, is the tensions in society, tensions between different groups. We measure here tensions between rich and poor, or management and labor, men and women, uh, and one relevant is maybe people with different racial and ethnic groups. That's the one that we are showing you there. Showing you, there. you see the EU uh, highlighted there, that it is around, uh, it's 41%. Uh, Ireland, it is uh, relatively low, well, not, not relatively, it is, it is among the lowest, 21%, which is remarkable for a country which has one of the highest share of foreign population living in the country. There are some elements that can nuance a bit this, okay, the, uh, here we don't count, for example, second generation that is very prominent in countries like the UK or France, or Belgium that you will find at the right side of the table, that they maybe are counted as nationals once that they get, get the national passport. And also the fact that most migration to, to Ireland, it is um, relatively heterogeneous. It's mostly European. The first countries, if I remember correctly, it is Poland, uh, the UK, uh, Lithuanian, and uh, I don't remember the others, but okay, European with Christian background. Uh, uh, that would make a difference from countries with much more uh, Muslim immigration, for example, or uh, African population that would make uh, maybe a bit even uh, more visible, if you want. And another element that could be relevant is also the uh, rel rel relatively high number of highly qualified foreigners living in the country working for all the high-tech companies in the country, Google, Facebook, uh, pharmaceutical, and others. However, very, very good sign in this, in, this, uh, in this slide. Trust. You see there the evolution of trust is from the Eurobarometer. Uh, the blue line it is the trust if the uh, Irish citizens tend to trust the European Union. You see that there was, it went down during the crisis, during the period of the bailout, and surprisingly, it went down also in the red line that it is for the national government. But it went up. If you take, uh, it's not here in the graph, the 2018 figures, I think it's even higher, and it is the majority of uh, Irish uh, people. Ireland is among, if not the, 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 the country with the highest level of um, trust and support to the EU. Uh, and it's important because uh, if you look at other countries, think about France, that X there marking France is the level of a uh, number of people that they tend to trust the European Union. And they have a very pro-European president at the moment. 
but if you look the uh, the whole population, the picture is not so so nice. Obviously, if you look at the UK, they voted to leave the the the, the, the union, so the level of trust in the union it was lower. But Italy is not that far away from the UK. If you look for, at, at Italy, for example, and the UK is not the, the country with the lowest level of trust in the EU. It's Greece. Maybe they have good reasons for that, but that is showing something, and it is relevant for your deliberations about the future of Europe, because if there's no trust in the EU as a such, in a way, some people are saying that the social contract is, is broken. We are giving power to an entity that we don't trust. That's not good news. Um, part, part of the discourse during the period of recovery after the crisis has been, okay, if we want to recover the trust, we have to make visible that the EU is doing something for the people. So put and make more in the social area. Don't focus only on finance and the banking system and the Eurozone, but focus on social. And you are fully aware that the European Union came with the social pillar or the European pillar of social rights, this set of 20 principles. I don't intend to go uh, along all of them. They are in three blocks, the equal opportunities and access to the labor market, the fair and working conditions, and the social protection and inclusion, these three blocks. Uh, this was proclaimed by the heads of government in Gothenburg. The Taoiseach was there. We had the privilege to be there. And now we are, we are in the phase of implementing this. If you take just the example of one of the principles, that is the work-life balance, a political agreement has been reached very recently uh, on the proposal of a directive for work-life balance of parents and carers. That will require some adjustment of the EU legislation, not a huge one, but, uh, but some adjustment increasing a bit uh, the opportunities for uh, work-life balance. But a lot of the implementation of the pillar is at the level of the member states and, or even the social partners themselves because the European Union has certain competencies but it's in the remit of the national governments really to make most of the changes. Uh, another tool that is very relevant for the EU uh, process, you are aware, uh, well, you will know it very well, is the European semester. You have a country report for Ireland that it is very, very positive because the situation in Ireland comparatively is very positive. But, of course, in any case, you receive some country-specific recommendations. You have here mentioned three of them and highlighted the one that is linked with the area in which we are working in Eurofound. This is a recommendation from the European Union to Ireland to ensure timely and effective implementation of the National Development Plan including elements related to housing and affordable uh, quality childcare. Is this recommendation coming out of the blue or is this related with some facts and objective figures? And I'm going to show you some. For example, in the European Quality of Life Survey, we ask citizens about their perception on the uh, quality of the public services. You have here a selected number of uh, public services education system, child care, health care, long-term care, state pension, public transport, and social housing. The blue square is the average of the European Union, of the average satisfaction of the Europeans. The green column, it is the rate of Ireland. So where you see the blue square within the green column is that Ireland is better than the EU average. So you are better in education or your citizens are rating better the education than the average European, and they are rating better the state pension system. In the rest, where you see the square above the green column, your citizens are rating below. And if I take it in order of uh, distance to the EU average, uh, uh, public transport would be where you have the biggest gap, followed by the health services. Uh, I know that you had some issues with the nurses and doctors recently. Uh, Childcare, I'm aware that some recent reforms that they probably they go in the right direction, and social housing. Nothing of this probably is a surprise to you because many of these issues are the kind of things that you are discussing in this, uh, in this parliament. Going to some of them, uh, the use and quality of social housing, we look, what you have here is a graph highlighted their island of the share 
of people that they are renting social, municipal, and non-for-profit housing. This is reflecting uh, um, social housing in one of the models. It's not the only model uh, to, to provide social housing, the rented one, but it's one of the, of the most prominent. You see Ireland is not too bad compared with the average, but 8% is far away, for example, for your, uh, of your neighbors. The, the UK, that is 20%, or you know, uh, even more, 26 the Netherlands. And we see a correlation between the percentage of houses available, social houses available for rent, with the perceived quality that you have there in the bubbles. So it's not a perfect correlation, but countries that they have a, a bigger amount of houses available to rent, social houses available to rent, people also tend to rate the quality uh, higher. In Ireland, the percentage is not too high, and the quality is considered uh, good. It's not that different, for example, if I make again the comparison with the UK that they made. There's a big difference in the number of houses available, but in the quality, the difference is not, uh, is not that big. If we look at other element, that it is about insecurity. Okay, there's a problem with uh, maybe homeless, but uh, how is Ireland in terms of global insecurity on housing? We have a question, how likely or unlikely do you think uh, it is that you will need to leave your accommodation within the next six months because you cannot longer afford it? That's the question that we raise. And if we exclude the very unlikely, so the people that they are pretty secure, we have this index of some level of insecurity, and you see Ireland, it is below the European average. The, average below the European average will be 24, Ireland is slightly below the 22. But if we look at the different kind of situations, of course the security is very low for those who own the house without a mortgage, a bit higher if they have a mortgage, okay, a bit higher if they have a, a municipal or social house, but you see the insecurity is highly concentrated in the rented houses or apartments in the private market. Again, this is not a surprise to you, and you took some measures already that maybe they are not yet reflected in this, in this survey, but the problem is concentrated in certain segments, so that's important to bear in mind. If we move to another service, that uh, uh, your rate is also below the EU average, you have childcare affordability. And here you have the comparison between the European Union and Ireland. Ireland in green, the European Union in blue. So if you look at the top, very difficult, because it's not affordable, it's not a big number, but it's almost double the EU average, 11 compared to 6. A little difficult, again, a bit below the double, but it is relatively close to double, and again, uh, but uh, opposite in the not difficult at all, where in Ireland uh, it is 35% and uh, in the EU not difficult at all will be 61%. Again, I'm aware that some recent measures have been taken and maybe the situation is changing in the right direction. I want to, to add something that is not uh, so much in the indexes that we pay normally attention, because it was uh, relevant uh, for the situation of Ireland, it's about mental health of young people. If you look at the uh, light blue columns there, they show you the people at risk of depression according to our survey. So Ireland there would be more or less average, 13%, so not, but if you look at the dark blue there, that's the actual reported chronic depression. So one is the being at risk, the other is the actual, and you see there that Ireland is rating, that's according not to one of our surveys, this is the Europe, this Eurostat, European Health Interview Survey, it is the highest in the European Union. If we want to dig a bit deeper, what is this? And we look in the same survey of the young people with severe or moderate depressive symptoms, we see that it's mainly young women, young women between 15 and 24, that's the blue bar. In all countries, women are rating higher than men, that is the gray columns, but Ireland again is the highest. Don't ask me many questions on this because I think that you are in a better position to understand the reasons, but certainly it is one of the indicators that we thought 
that it was relevant. And uh, not wanting to end my presentation in a depressing mode, talking about depression, uh, I wanted to say something. You have the stars here in the logo of the family of you um, um, agencies. You have one in Ireland that it is um, Eurofound. You almost had another one that was the banking authority, but finally there was bad luck. Some uh, are discussing that uh, we are already too many, over 40 agencies in the European Union spread all over the countries, as you can see there. A lot of people are talking about mergers or synergies, and, but uh, on the contrary, new agencies are created. The, new, the, 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 the next one to come probably to be adopted already at this uh, month will be the European Labour Authority or European Labour Agency, whatever the name is finally approved is likely to, to be approved in this legislative period of the European Parliament. And then the Council will discuss where to place it. I don't know if Ireland has an interest or not, but I can tell you that there are nice grounds in Lucklestown that they belong to the OPW. They are rented to Eurofound, but there are enough room for another building. And we talk a lot about synergies and uh, having common and shared services and that will be an agency operating in the social and employment field. So we are, I think that uh, Ireland could do, if Ireland wants a case for that, knowing and being aware that the highest likelihood it is that this new agency will end in a country that has no agency at all, one of the newest member states. Romania or Croatia or Latvia are, for example, good candidates. I think almost all countries have volunteered to host the agency with the exception of the UK. Um, I want to finish telling you that we have much more than this. Everything is in our website, but of course you can contact us. We have a country page about Ireland with a lot of indicators, not so much to inform you, but to inform other countries about the situation in Ireland. But of course, you're welcome also to look at this and let us know your concerns and priorities and we are happy to assist you further. And uh, I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that presentation, Director. Well, there's certainly a lot of food for thought there for all of us. Uh, could I first of all go to the Vice Chairman, Senator Terry Layden, please? Thank you very much, um, Chairman. I'd like to welcome the Director and his colleagues. And uh, I suppose starting off by a very interesting and um, potential of the European uh, Labour um, uh, Director. I think that's the government, I hope, is very much aware of that, and uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Minister for Social Affairs, should be very active in that regard, because it seems uh, logical to, to join with you yourselves here in Ireland, whether it's a local town or somewhere else, but at least you would have that type of labour relations in, in Ireland, I think. In light of Brexit, I think we should be given special consideration because of the um, challenges we face, and that your organisation is 20 million euros here in Ireland, which is a very big contribution, 100 jobs approximately or thereabouts. So that's very important, so because I was very disappointed that we lost the medical agency, which was, went from Britain, UK, and also financial services. We were uh, outmaneuvered in those cases, and we were uh, outlobbied, and uh, I think, quite frankly, um, we should have been getting one of those agencies in Ireland, particularly we, as we are the biggest losers in relation to um, Brexit, one way or the other. But that being said, in relation to the uh, interesting uh, information you have there, uh, it's, it's interesting the social housing side. I'm surprised at the level, the low level here, compared to other European countries, quite frankly. And it's something that, you know, it's evident now that we have enough social housing. And that's why we have 10,000 people on, without houses in, in Dublin and, and throughout the regions. In relation to the um, mental health of young people, that's a very uh, serious situation and I presume that all the information you have there is sent directly to the Department of Health and the Ministry in relation to uh, mental health. You know, it's, it's very graphic exactly what's happening and it's very concerning because you've elaborated further in relation to young people with severe or moderate uh, depressive symptoms. They're, they're, they're worrying trends in that particular regard. But the fact is that um, you know, knowledge is power in a sense, and the fact that you are preparing this information is giving the people, the people who are involved in policy formation, certainly uh, the facts and comparative facts all over Europe. 
But that being said, uh, so work, wish you well in your work uh, in the uh, agency and your colleagues. And I'm delighted you got a chance to come here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, Deputy Sean Hawhey, please. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Chairman. I'd like to thank the uh, Director and his team for coming here today and for presenting uh, the information as you have. Um, it, it's really interesting, you know, the, the, your research and your findings generally in, in relation to Ireland. Um, it's a very positive note for, for Ireland, I think, um, in many respects, but um, the, obviously, obviously there's no room for complacency, and us policymakers would, would, would know that. There, there are alarm bells there in relation to uh, public services, including uh, childcare and public transport. <clears throat> uh, certainly I'd be aware of that as a, a public representative here in, in the greater Dublin area. Um, just in relation to uh, young people, in relation to the two different surveys, the working conditions and the quality of life. I think there is a view that young people, uh, uh, the, the upcoming generation, are finding things difficult in relation to employment, permanent employment. Um, can you pick that up in, in, your, in your surveys? You know, is, is a lot of the work that young people are engaged in you know, contract work or part-time work or you know, we have zero-hour contracts and so on. Uh, are, are their living and working conditions uh, deteriorating? So I'm wondering what the, what the trends are in, in that regard. And the other question I have is just in relation to uh, comparing and contrasting with other great uh, states in the world like Canada or Australia. Uh, how does the EU... Uh, com compare in, in, in relation to your survey with, for example, Canada and Australia, where a lot of our young people are emigrating to, either on a short-term basis or, or a long-term basis. So international comparisons uh, between the EU and, and some of these other uh, nation states. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Deputy. Deputy Bernard Durkin, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I welcome our guests and thank them for the very interesting uh, report, the study, and... and, and, and uh, the, the graph uh, details. A couple of comments. Um, the, the issue in relation to housing is not new to us. We are conscious of that ourselves. We've been concerned about it for, for some time. In actual fact, and this is uh, just my personal opinion, the very word social housing, I think, uh, for some unknown reason, since we began to use that phrase, we've had difficulty meeting the required level of, of housing that used to be called local authority or, 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 or uh, uh, public housing, uh, the public housing program. Uh, I think that the extent to which uh, uh, people are shown to be in fear of losing their housing uh, situation arising from landlords moving in, etc., uh, we're, we're aware of that. It's, it's, it's a serious issue. It has been a serious issue for the last number of years. I also am conscious of the fact that throughout Europe there's a greater history of uh, families living in rented accommodation than there are in this country. In this country, 150 years ago or so, there was a war. It was called a land war. But the purpose of the exercise was to establish the right of the individual to own their own land, home, whatever it was. And it's very much intrinsic in the Irish psyche uh, to this stage and will remain that way. Uh, because, because that is seen by people in this country as a basic anchor to which they can build themselves and their families around. If they don't have that, it tends to, to engender in their thinking uh, a level of insecurity that, to my mind, doesn't apply in the rest of Europe because there's a greater tradition of, of uh, 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 reliance on public housing uh, throughout uh, the rest of Europe. I know that just applied all cases, but there's a greater uh, level. I think the, the, the interesting um, uh, part of the, the, the study has been the uh, in interracial tension. I, I, um, we're bad that that's, that has shown up. I think that's as, as it should be. Uh, I think that's part and parcel, um, unfortunately, from our immigration levels in the past. Uh, we as a race have uh, lived in, in most in most countries, and in fact, some will tell you in every country, all over the globe, as a result of which uh, Irish people have become more accustomed to working with other nationalities, living in, in, in areas along with other nationalities, and uh, don't see the same level of, 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 of uh, 
a need to differentiate one with another. I think, I think that's positive. I think the, 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 the mental health issue, Chairman, is, is alarming. It's something we, we're aware of, particularly amongst young people and particularly amongst, amongst young women. Uh, we're conscious of this. This has been, we, we've spoken about it in the houses of the Iraqis many, many times. Uh, we have seen the instances uh, where this, uh, from, from depression to serious depression to, 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 to self-harm, and we've monitored it, and we, we, there are a number, a variety of, of things that we seem to feel are the cause. Insecurity is one. Uh, um, lack of confidence is, is you know, lack of self-esteem. Uh, the use of the, of the, of the internet or, or by, by, by young people uh, who find themselves um, taken over, as it were, by what goes on in, 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 on, on the internet. And uh, we have seen the numerous instances where um, young people have engaged with, for want of a better description, a lot older people in, in, in unsuitable uh, uh, um, dialogue. Uh, again, for want of a better description. I think it's something that we have to uh, look at, uh, Mr. Chairman, because we have to protect our, our, our young generation. And uh, that means that we have to control the technology that they have access to, uh, to their own detriment uh, at the present time and growing. And I think that that's, uh, we all do uh, um, engage with our constituents on a daily and weekly basis in our various advice clinics, and we come across these situations all the time. And it is tragic uh, when, when, when one is met face to face with, with, with uh, what's, you know, internet bullying or whatever, whatever it was. And particularly young, amongst young schoolgirls, where it's quite common uh, to, for, for them to become the victims of a concerted campaign uh, by some sometimes within the school and sometimes outside the school and sometimes obviously off school time. I think that's where the technology has to be controlled. I think there has to be some means found to ensure that, that young people are not abused uh, in, in a fashion that has uh, tended to undermine their self-confidence and their self-esteem uh, with obvious detriment to themselves and society. I think that in, in most other cases uh, we have scored fairly well, if the word scoring is, is the appropriate word to use there, Mr Chairman, and I, I think that it gives for reassurance. Childcare costs, two, two, two final issues, Chairman. Uh, Childcare costs, yes, they are a serious, serious situation, and they are a serious situation because of the cost of housing. Now, it's a personal view of mine, uh, there is a theory amongst people globally, that one feels better if one lives in a very expensive house. I don't think it makes any difference. I think a house is a house is a house. It's there for security, for, for, for obviously for shelter, and so on. And the theory that if you don't live in a really expensive house, you know, you really have made it. I think that's something that we should, we should, we, we all have to look at, not only here, but throughout Europe as well. Because uh, <clears throat> when you live in, when, when all house property, Residential property becomes expensive. Childcare is going to be obviously become a victim, and we have reached a situation now where the cost of childcare, even with, with with government intervention and government support, we have that now as well. It's effectively the cost of a mortgage for two or three children. Two children is cost about the same as a mortgage, and that is not sustainable. It puts a huge burden on the family. And uh, so that's why I think we need to have uh, uh, lower housing costs, which at the present time force both partners, uh, spouses in the household to work in the early stages of the lives of the children in particular, because um, they, they, they have to work to raise the mortgage. So the, 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 the moral of the story, Chairman, is this, I'm sorry for going on so long about it, is that the cost of providing a house lives with the family from the day they first purchase until almost the time that they come to retire. And it is an overhanging, uh, uh, an overbearing influence on their lives. So I, I, I go back to where I started on, 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 on that one. Access to health services. We do have one of the highest levels of expenditure on health services in, in the OECD countries, with fourth, I think, fourth, maybe fifth, but generally around fourth. Uh, and um, we don't have the same access that appears to be uh, there for our European colleagues. 
it is impossible to find out what the cause of it is. And we have been at, 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 at odds with ourselves and with, 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 with others in an effort to find that out. And um, I know that it, it, well, we feel we know that it, it comes as a result of a, a multiplicity of factors. But the, 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 the issue now is this, that if we cannot gain ready access on the basis of the expenditure we already have, compared with other European countries throughout the 27, 28 or whatever, it raises the question, what are we doing wrong? And we, are, we're, we need to do more about that particular issue, Chairman, because we don't and we shouldn't be faced with a situation where we have to pay more uh, than most other European countries in order to achieve a, a less, a lesser access. And I think we need to deal with that. Last, last uh, point, Chairman, is that uh, one of the things we always hear about, about in European circles is bringing Europe nearer to the people. I think that needs to be reversed. I think the people have to come nearer, closer to Europe. I think that by coming closer to Europe from the various geographic locations across the European continent, they, we, the people of Europe, will come to realise that we are part of a circle, uh, that circle of, of community, and that we have something to contribute to it, and that uh, we can contribute to it, and we do contribute to it in a meaningful way. If, on the other hand, we resign from that objective, and we wait for Europe to come to us, which it does in the ordinary sense in very many ways, construction, social cohesion, etc., uh, and, ha and has done. But the theory is, uh, my belief, that in the countries that are waiting for Europe to come towards them, I think they need also to look at the extent to which they can come towards Europe in order to achieve the European ideal in the way that was originally intended. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy. Um, could I just ask the Director a couple of questions uh, myself? Um, for instance, on a humorous note, I'd love to know what they're doing in Denmark, that they're so happy there, because I think we might all think about moving there. Um, now, when we speak about the volunteer, uh, volunteering, I'm just wondering, for the accuracy of that statistic, like probably the most biggest, best organization, in my own humble opinion, that we have in Ireland is the GEA. And uh, was the volunteering aspect of that taken into account when compiling this statistic? Because if it was, okay, but if it wasn't, it would greatly disproportionate the accuracy of the volunteering side of that statistic. Um, then other, also generally for the EU-wide impact, like is, are there a couple of things, maybe two or three, three things that the EU could do that would improve everybody's lot? Like in your experience as director, uh, you obviously are very experienced at compiling all of this, but is there anything from your own expertise that you would start to say, right, if as the EU, as we are, is there one thing or two things or three things that we could do that would change everybody's lives in a positive way? Be that health-wise, work-wise, sport-wise, whatever, just general living. Is there something that you would propose that if you had the power tomorrow morning to make a suggestion that you might think would have a positive impact on all of our lives? Not just us in Ireland, but globally around Europe, if that makes sense. Um, now, and again, I suppose this is a follow-on from that. Like, if you look at the statistics that you gave, that which um, were applicable to us, uh, it looks like we're doing well. But like, like everything in life, competitiveness is great. I always like to think that whatever you're doing, you're not doing enough, any one of us. We're all in that category, and we should all push ourselves better and further and harder. Uh, so. It looks like we're doing okay, but again, is there something that we should be doing ourselves? And to pull ourselves up a bit and pull up our socks, is there something else? And when I say we, then I mean we as politicians, be we senators or TDs or whether it is ministers in government. Uh, and I know you can't obviously be politically motivated about it, but again, I turn it around to you and say, if you were uh, in a position tomorrow morning to make suggestions to us as to what would be something that we should do to pull up our socks, what would it be? And as legislators, what would you like to see us doing? Do you know? If, if that's okay. Um, I think we're all right. If, if you can give us 
uh, a separate comprehensive overview and, um, and, 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 and on one hand um, we'd appreciate your answers and at the same time we have to con concise it because of the fact of time constraints. So thank you, Director. Thank you for the, all the very interesting uh, questions and remarks and comments you know, that they are also enriching our own reflection. Okay, to go to, through some of them, not all of them. Uh, some, uh, well, first on the, on the, if we make the information available to the different services, we, we try, we are not necessarily target each department, but we generally are making available this to, to the national, to the, to the government. And we have a member uh, exactly of the uh, Irish government in our board that is receiving the whole information and can further distribute. Um, one of the questions that have been mentioned by, by several and probably can be joined with one of the um, final reflections of the chair, okay, what, what could be relevant would be around the public services. That's where you see, okay, well, relatively positive image in, in many things for Ireland, but not so much in the perception of, of, the, of the quality of a number of services, some of, of them uh, better than others. And uh, I'm saying this particularly because there's a very high correlation between the perception of citizens on the quality of the public services and the trust they have in the national government and the national institutions. So you see that the countries where the uh, uh, trust in the public governments and the international governments and public institutions, parliaments and uh, other institutions is highest is in the Nordic countries where they have also a very, very high uh, perceived quality of the public services. So they pay a lot of taxes, but they think that they receive a lot in return. Um, and uh, you have pointed out uh, clearly, and that, that was one thing that I, uh, living myself in Ireland already for a number of years, I have noticed, it's not necessarily an issue of money. Uh, the, the health system is the perfect uh, example. Uh, you invest uh, well above the average in the health system. But the access and the affordability and the, uh, and the quality perceived by the citizens is lower. Certainly, I'm not in a situation uh, to tell you a diagnosis. I, I can give you off the record some personal experiences or opinions, but it would be totally anecdotal. No, 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 not scientific, so I wouldn't there. But it's not necessarily in transport, probably it's about money. Okay, when you want more transport, you need more infrastructure that costs money. In health or in education, it's not necessarily money. You have countries that they are uh, childcare. You have countries that they are less generous with uh, child benefits, for example, but they have free um, health education and care. And that's a political choice. I'm not saying that it is one better than the other, but uh, there are elements that can be done within certain limits in public budget that you will always have. And certainly, if there's one thing to do that can increase the trust of the people, it's, it goes in this, in this uh, direction. Um, evolution of the uh, labor market, particularly for young people, part-time, temporary employment, precarious jobs, and so on. Ireland is not that bad if you compare with other uh, countries in the EU. Uh, the general trend is part-time is increasing all over Europe. The rest uh, is not so, so much changing. Yes, we have uh, in the UK, the zero hours contract and some forms of what we call casual work that they are not positive, that they are, have been looking at because we have to avoid abuses. And, uh, and but temporary employment is not increasing. And we have to look, and we have a lot of work done about the new forms of employment. And for example, the people that are working in platforms, the people delivering food with a bike or uh, the, the, the Uber drivers or the, 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 number, the platform economy, there we have a new forms of employment that we have to look at how they are evolving because they have positive elements but elements that certainly are not so, so positive. Global comparisons, we do some but not a lot because we, our main mandate is the EU, so most of our reports will be similar what you, to what you have seen, a comparison of 20 uh, eight member states, sometimes the candidate countries. In a few projects, we go outside of the EU and we compare globally. We are about to publish with the ILO, the International Labour Organization, a report on comparison on working conditions across the world. We have not included, because we don't have data on the countries that you have mentioned, Canada or Australia, but we will have 
uh, information from the U.S., from Southern Korea, and for uh, uh, other regions uh, in the world. And that's important in a globalized world because also we don't want that the world is competing on the basis of lower conditions or lowering conditions. Um, the point that you have made on ownership of the houses, I come from a country where uh, also traditionally the majority of the people like to own not so much their house but their apartment because we, we are in cities at least we, we live mainly in apartments there. But uh, I was told by a colleague, by a Spain expert, that the, uh, the ownership uh, of houses and apartments in Ireland has declined significantly in the recent years. So it's also maybe, I don't know, if linked to the affordability also of foreign population coming, that they are not, don't, don't want to buy because they don't intend to, to stay permanently. You have mentioned the issue of, of migration and tensions and the, the history of Ireland. And uh, probably this play a role. I come from a region as well with a, a long history of migration to America first and then to, to, to more developed countries in Europe. But it's not, it's not given the full picture. Italy, is, it was an immigration country and the tensions there are very high now at the moment. So probably it's a combination of factors, but certainly it's, certainly it's good. And at least even if it, it's, if it is to preserve, it's good to observe why it's so good in Ireland and what can we do to, to keep it that way. Three things uh, on, on the volunteering. I think that we have a separate, a separate question on the sports. Uh, and here we talk about volunteering, but I'm not 100% sure we can reply to you if the GEA activities would be... The GEA would be included because in it's unpaid... Uh work. Uh, volunteering work, yeah. would be. So it would be included and then there's a separate question on sports. Do you participate regularly in sports, uh, which is a separate uh, item, but this GAA would be considered volunteering. The people that they are organizing the thing would be volunteering. The actual playing the yeah. game would be and the other yeah. question that it's a sport. Yeah. Where Ireland also rates higher than the average. So you're a sports country. Um, yeah, the three things to, that, that's very, very difficult, you know, that, that's uh, at European level. Uh, if we have to build on success, I think that some of your comments uh, reminded me, for example, the successful uh, programs, Erasmus, has been a great experience and uh, it's being expanded now. It is, okay, it's, it's going in the direction of this bringing also the citizens to Europe. So if you are more exposed to other uh, cultures and then this is uh, rich in your own culture and it is, is, is giving a, a broader sense of, of belonging to the same continent. Uh, certainly, we have been doing some research about uh, convergence and divergence in Europe. The history of Europe and the, my country, your country, are good examples of countries that they have been uh, not only catching up in the case of, of Ireland surpassing many of their best performers in many areas. So it's good to be a member of the club because we're going to grow together, we're going to improve, to have social pro uh, progress together. The experience of the Greeks, for example, recently, because you went through a bailout, but you are in a very good position now, they are not. So that's explained but, uh, uh, some of the results there. No, what they see that the European Union is giving to them is uh, at the moment poverty, rightly or wrongly. I'm not saying that everything that they have done is it, it, it's it's wonderful, but that's the, the that the, that's the situation. So looking at that, the EU policies provide this convergence that nobody is left behind, that people are catching up, and you have very good examples. Poland is a great example. They have been growing. They didn't have a crisis at all. You know, they have been growing constantly uh, during uh, since they joined the the, the European Union. And uh, issues of no complacency, and I would mix here part of the evidence and the part of my own perceptions as a foreigner living in Ireland. I think the, the, I refer to the, the health system. It's an issue to look at, certainly. And um, Oh, yes, and something that is not here, and that's, again, totally maybe a stupid comment, uh, but it's a general perception, but... Uh, 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 broader. This country is doing very well, but is relying a lot on the huge foreign investment in a number of big companies, which for a small country is making a huge difference. And this rate, I think any other country in the, in the EU would be envying Ireland for doing that, but it can create also 
some uh, some undesired effects like uh, higher prices uh, for the whole population, higher salaries maybe, and the underlying competitiveness of the uh, traditionally Irish business and so on can be affected by that. Uh, so sometimes we talk a lot about um, um, wages, I tend to, and again I'm hearing a bit in the position of more in opinion, a personal opinion, and I think the problem of Ireland, I don't know all the wages, the problem of Ireland is not wages, it's prices. And take it from the, the cost of, a, of some pills, if you go to the pharmacy, to any other example, having a coffee or uh, with, except, with exception of the goods that they have the same price all over the world, like a car or a computer, uh, that's, but again, uh, this is not scientifically sound, so probably I shouldn't say it. Thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, <clears throat> could I thank you and your officials for coming here today? I really believe that f from our own perspective, from our work, daily work perspective, uh, having all this information and having it uh, easily available and following on from the presentation, uh, it's really going to be helpful to us in our work. And uh, I'd like to thank you and your officials for taking time to be here with us. Um, and I have no doubt we will have interaction again in the future. And I believe that the work that you are doing is very, very important, again, in allowing us to uh, find ourselves in a situation where we can use your work as being knowledgeable in helping us uh, formulating opinions, uh, policies, uh, with regard to all aspects of life. And, uh, and again, we'll really have to look at the DINMAP model and see what they're doing there and study that. So uh, could I, at this stage, um, could I suspend the meeting for a few minutes to leave the director and his staff uh, to leave and to thank you most sincerely again, and then we will be going into private session uh, for the remainder of the meeting.